say this morning that as we come to the 18th chapter of Luke's Gospel, we will be considering how to wait for the kingdom and how to wait well for the return of the Son of Man. Thomas McCree, in his book, The Story of the Scottish Church from the Reformation to the Disruption, he told the story of the covenanter James Guthrie who was sentenced to be hanged on June 1st, 1661, among the charges levied against him. Perhaps the most formidable of that was that he rejected the king's ecclesiastical authority, and he was sentenced to be hung for that and other Protestant positions and Protestant beliefs. And he was sentenced to be hanged at the cross of Edinburgh. Now, in addition to the death sentence and being hanged, He subsequently, after he was martyred, his head was to be struck off and publicly displayed. His estate was to be confiscated and, quoting Thomas McCree, his children declared incapable in all time coming to enjoy any office, dignities, possessions, lands, or goods, movable or immovable within the kingdom. So he was executed, and following his execution... The headless corpse of Guthrie was put into a coffin and brought to the old Kirk Isle where it was prepared for burial by, as McCree puts it, a number of highly respectable ladies. And it was noticed by someone who was there. At some point, somehow, some of the ladies had dipped their napkins into some of the blood that had spilt from James Guthrie's body. And this man who had seen this kind of thing happening, he challenged that behavior and he accused them of representing, quote, a piece of popish superstition. He said this kind of isn't a thing that becomes Protestants. This is the kind of thing that becomes popish superstition. And one of the ladies who heard this replied by saying, We intend not to abuse it to superstition or idolatry, but to hold that bloody napkin up to heaven with our address that the Lord would remember the innocent blood that is spilt. So these women, they weren't going to retaliate. They weren't going to take vengeance into their own hands. They were going to commit the cause of vengeance to Yahweh. They were going to trust that He was going to right the injustice that was done. At some point and at some time, He would do so. And that bloody napkin was a token that they were trusting for Him to do that. They believed that Yahweh cared about the injustice that was perpetrated, that He would right the wrong. And they were in that regard, at least, the kind of people that the Son of Man is looking for when He returns to this earth. In that sense, at least, they knew how to wait for the kingdom well. If you're going to wait for the kingdom well, it's important that you be found faithful when the Son of Man returns. And it's important to understand within the context of this parable what that kind of faith is. You might say it's a full gospel view of Isaiah 61, the opening verses. What I mean by that is this. If we were to look at Isaiah 61, and I begin at verse 1, you would notice that there are verses that I'm going to read to you that are very familiar. And then you'll notice that there's at least one verse that is often easily forgotten and overlooked. In Isaiah 61, beginning at verse 1, we read, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. You might say, in a sense, that's the full gospel of Isaiah 61. If you remember, Jesus stopped his reading in the synagogue right before that last line that I read. Jesus stopped at to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord in Luke chapter 4, 
verse 19, indicating that the day of salvation was tied to his first coming and not going on to that other line and the day of vengeance of our God, not reading that because that is connected to his second coming. But both are quintessentially important for his people to understand and embrace. His people, particularly his beaten, abused, suffering, hating, trampled people know that both of those aspects of Isaiah 61, both of them are good news. And Yahweh thinks His people need to know that. He thinks that they, when they are afflicted, this reality of His vengeance will bring them assurance. In Isaiah 35, verse 4, we read, Yahweh speaking through the prophet Isaiah, Say to those who are fearful hearted, Be strong, do not fear. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With the recompense of God, He will come and save you. So it's important for Christians to be protected from the false notion that they will never be wronged and that nobody will ever do any harm to them or malign them or abuse them or trample on them or persecute them. It's important to be relieved of that kind of foolish, unbiblical notion. And it helps when you hear those assurances of Yahweh for His people to do what James called the church to do in James chapter 5, verse 7. Quote, Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Such is in good measure an aim of the parable that is before us. As we come into Luke 18, it begins with two very popular parables of Jesus. This morning we'll give our attention to the first, which is found in verses 1 through 8. As with many of the parables of Jesus, this one is to subject to misinterpretation and misapplication. In the case of this parable, however, it's typically not because the reader or the commentator goes off the allegorical deep end and begins to assign meanings to parts of this parable that was never intended. That's usually not what happens here. What usually happens, interestingly, is that the context is overlooked. And the main point of the parable is missed. So what somebody will do when they read this parable, typically, they won't come up with a heresy if they read it wrong. Typically. You won't do that. But what you will do is you'll come up with a, a meaning that lacks the contextual bearings of what precedes it and what proceeds it. And that's very important. And we're going to open up in verse 1 with considering the contextual question that is before us. So we begin in Luke chapter 18, verse 1, where we read, Then he spoke a parable to them, that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Now remember, just because we're in a different chapter does not mean that we are in a different setting. All the contextual clues point to the fact that Jesus is continuing along the same vein of the discourse he just concluded. This is just, he's just flowing out of the discourse of the return of the Son of Man and the judgment that was coterminous with the coming of the Son of Man. So it's after that flows this parable. He spoke a parable to them. An appropriate first question to ask is, who is the them that Luke refers to right here? The answer is found, if you look back, in Luke chapter 17, verse 22. After Jesus answered a question that was brought to him by the Pharisees, Luke 17, 20, and he answered the question in the second half of verse 20, and then in verse 21, then he turned to his disciples. Luke chapter 17, verse 22. And what was it that he told his disciples? He turned to them and he told them this. The days will come when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you will not see it. That is incredibly important. That is the non-negotiable contextual puzzle piece that precedes the parable. If you miss that part of it, you're going to come up with a general call to persistent prayer, which is biblical, but isn't the central aim here. The central aim here is more specific. Because if you look at what precedes this parable, it's that calling right there, that warning. And then Jesus' description of his coming. And then if you look at the conclusion of this parable, if you glance ahead to verse 8, again, Jesus is talking about his coming. So it's the coming of the Son of Man that frames this parable. 
This isn't a call to persistent prayer in general. This is a call for people to pray with persistent prayer in light of the Son of Man's return and for the Son of Man's return. Persistent prayer in general is a biblical calling. You and I are called to persist and be persistent in prayer. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2 says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Romans chapter 12, verse 12 says that believers ought to be continuing steadfastly in prayer. Ephesians 6.18 says that believers ought to be praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So the call to persistent prayer is a biblical one. And in a place like 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, that is the call. But that's not the aim of the parable here in Luke chapter 18. It's not just to a persistent prayerful life in general. It's a call to persistent prayer in light of the Son of Man's coming and for the Son of Man's return. This would be incredibly important for the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ considering the weighty matter that He had just spoken of. Think about what He told them. You're going to long for. It means you're going to be praying for. You're going to be hoping for just one of the days of the Son of Man. It's going to get hard. It's going to get really hard. And you're going to long to see it. And you won't see it. So what are you going to do? What are you going to do when there's afflictions, when there's famines, when there's delays and all the answers to prayer that you're hoping for? Are you going to faint? Are you going to grow weary? Or will you persist? Will you lose heart, give up, stop praying, stop looking for the return of Christ, grow weary in well-doing? Or will you persist in prayer? This parable was meant to protect them from that and encourage them to watch and pray even when they don't see the answer to their prayers for the kingdom's arrival, when they don't see the answer to their prayers for vindication, and when they don't see the answer of their prayers for Jesus' return. And so it is for us. Now to illustrate this point, Jesus tells a story involving two characters, a widow and a judge. First, we are introduced to, note this, I would argue, the central character of the story The unjust judge. He's a central character, not because he's a hero or anything like that, far from that. But he is the one to whom Jesus calls our direct attention when he finishes the parable. He's the central character, I would argue. And first we're introduced to him. We read, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. So Jesus doesn't give the name of the city. He just refers to generically a certain city. Undoubtedly, his Israelite hearers would have thought of the trappings of some sort of Israelite city. And this judge was likely a local municipality of some sort, a local judge. So he's serving alone, as opposed to some of the historical writings that we have, which says that the judges in Israel used to serve in tribunals. This guy is alone, which suggests that he represents some sort of local municipality. So here he is, a judge, and he was not a very good guy. Notice how Jesus described this judge. See, many of the, maybe the people were thinking of some pseudo-religious, lawless Herod appointee. And if they were thinking something like that, they weren't far off. Because Jesus describes this judge like this. He, quote, did not fear God nor regard man. Sounds like a sweetheart, right? <laughs> not at all. This guy did not care about, if you will, the first table of the Ten Commandments nor the second table of the Ten Commandments. He didn't care care about the portions that deal directly with God, and he didn't care about the portions that deal directly with man. He didn't care about the greatest commandment, to love the Lord God with all your heart, and he didn't care about the second one, that was like the first, to love your neighbor as yourself. He didn't have passion for God, nor did he have compassion for people. He wasn't concerned with theological concerns, and he wasn't concerned with humanitarian concerns. So what was he concerned with? Ah, the implication is clear. Himself. Wasn't concerned about God, wasn't concerned about men, but the implication is, cared enough about himself. So did he care about justice? No, if you don't care about God and you don't care about people, 
especially in that context of Israel, you certainly do not care about justice. He cared about what was good for him, and that's why Jesus identified him, in verse 6, as an unjust and unrighteous judge. Now here's a quick word for judges. Here's a good application for judges. Judges ought to be what this man is not. Judges ought to be impartial, weigh evidence, evaluate witnesses, and rightly apply the law with a sense of honoring God and with a sense of compassion towards people. When Moses told the people of Israel that he was charging judges, when he appointed judges for the people of Israel, he charged them very specifically in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the alien who is with him. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone for the judgment is God's. In the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me and I will hear it. He, under the jurisdiction of God, was, if you will, the supreme court in Israel. And the people were to obey, the judges were to serve with impartiality and respect and reverence, but Israel had a problem with judges who feared men more than they feared God and loved money more than they loved justice. And Jehoshaphat, when he was resetting up judges in the fortified cities of Judah, he gave some very good instruction for judges that, are, that is definitely applicable for anybody who serves in any kind of jurisdiction like that today. He said, reading from Second Chronicles 19, verses 6 and 7, Take heed to what you are doing, for you do not judge for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. Now, therefore, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take care and do it, for there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, no partiality, nor taking of bribes. And that was within the context of the theocracy of Israel, but by extension it does have application because those who serve in such a capacity of authority are referred to as God's ministers in Romans chapter 13, verses 4 and 6. So the application does carry over. Adam Clark said it well, if you understand what he meant and what he didn't mean when he said, Judges should feel themselves in the place of God and judge as those who know they shall be judged for their judgments. They don't take the place of God, but everyone who serves as a judge will be judged as one who ought to be serving as God's minister. Romans 13, verses 4 and 6. This judge was not that. Furthermore, this was not the kind of judge that you would want to go to. You would want to avoid this judge at all costs, but the next character that we're introduced didn't have that luxury. In verse 3 we read, Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. So before we consider what this woman said, let's first consider who she was. She was a widow. She was among the most vulnerable people in Israel. She was one of the most vulnerable members of society. Even today, according to an article written by Tom Rainer, Seven Reasons Your Church Should Have a Ministry to Widows, if a widow loses her spouse, she loses 75% of her support base. And another point brought out in the article, the poverty rate among widows is three to four times higher than elderly married women. So as an aside, quick note for men that are married, this is why it's important that you have life insurance and why you practice good stewardship while you are married. It's a quick practical aside, but nonetheless, it's an, a point that we should be aware of. Widows were then, and they have been, typically among the most vulnerable members of society, but they especially were in ancient Israel. If a woman lost her husband, she lost her means of support by and large. And she was on her own. If she didn't have family members to come alongside of her and support her, which it seems that this woman did not, that's why she's on her own, going to the judge. There's nobody else to represent her. She's on her own. She is the epitome of a woman who was in one of the most vulnerable positions in Israelite society. And God was very specific over and over again in the Old Testament and in the New Testament that such a people group should be looked out for 
In Exodus chapter 22, verses 22 through 24, the Lord commanded through Moses, You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any way and they cry at all to me, I will surely hear their cry and my wrath will become hot and I will kill you with the sword. Your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. That's how serious this kind of thing is to God. That's how serious the protection and non-exploitation of that people group is to God. In Deuteronomy 10.18, we're told that the Lord, quote, administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. This carries over into the New Testament. One of the things we see most immediately in the New Testament church is in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, that the church is supporting the widows who are among them. The Hebrew and the Greek widows that were among them. If you go on to 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3, Paul instructs Timothy, and by extension the church, to honor all widows who are really widows. Which meant, if they did not have family support... And if they met the criteria listed out in 1 Timothy 5, they were to be supported by the church. That mandate is still in effect today. Our church and churches are responsible for such a widow who meets that criteria to be supported by the church. They're to be looked out for and cared for, not abused and taken advantage of like the Pharisees did. Mark chapter 12, verse 40. And like many televangelists do, they're not supposed to be abused and used. Their houses are not to be devoured by those who are greedy for gain. Back to the story. We don't know much about her. We don't know her age. We don't know who her adversary was. We don't know the wrong that was done to her. All we know is that she was in a situation where the only means of recourse that she had was this unjust judge. So you immediately have a lot of reasons to have sympathy for her, and maybe, parabolically speaking, the greatest of which is that her only means of recourse is this unjust judge. So she goes and she wanted justice, we're told in verse 3. The NASB renders it like this. Give me legal protection from my opponent. So the idea was she was being affronted and defrauded in some way. And she needed legal protection and legal retribution. And this unjust judge was the only means she had. She was in a desperate state. As you see, she has no friends or family pleading the case for her. She is on her own. And all she wanted was for the judge to deliver her from the attacks of her adversary. And she pleads and she does not get it. But she doesn't give up. In verses 4 and 5 we read, And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So he wouldn't give her what she wanted, according to the text, for a while. She wouldn't do it for a while. But she kept coming. He was callous to her agony. Her cries were but a temporary annoyance to her but she kept coming she kept persisting you can imagine that these details aren't in the parable but you can get the picture that Jesus is painting you can imagine this unjust judge showing up for work and who's there before he even gets to the bench you guessed it there she is the persistent widow he comes to work the next day he looks doesn't see her he says, all right, this is going to be easier today. She just came yesterday. She's certainly not coming back today. Maybe it's an every other day kind of thing. And he's about to sit down to the bench. And who comes into his line of sight? You guessed it. The persistent widow. That's the idea. That she just didn't stop coming. He's putting her off. But she keeps persisting. She keeps walking through the door. She keeps pleading. She keeps asking. And then finally, he gets to the point where he says within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, so this guy's wicked. Hold on to that. Jesus wants you to notice everything about this man that he says. Though I do not fear God nor regard man, he knows he's wicked. He's not self-deceived. He knows he doesn't love God or care about people. That's how wicked this man is. And even though that's who I am, I'm going to give this widow what she wants. Because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. 
he would finally avenge her, i.e., he would finally give her legal retribution, vindication. He would finally give her justice because by her continual coming, she was wearying him. The word weary in the Greek is an interesting one. Hupo piazzo. That's the Greek word that's used here. Literally, what the word means can be rendered like this. To strike someone under the eye. Some render it like this, to give someone a black eye. So literally, to strike someone under the eye, implication may be, to give someone a black eye. It was as though the judge was saying this, I'm going to give her what she wants because she's beating me down, proverbially speaking. She wasn't literally beating him up. She wasn't showing up every day saying, okay, you ready again? We're going to go another round unless you give me what I want. But proverbially speaking, she was beating him down, wearing him down with her persistent coming. So finally... He relents to her beseeching. And out of selfishness, self-interest, and somewhat self-preservation, if you will, he grants her the vindication. All right, finally, finally, you know what, you'll get it. I'll give you the justice that you're looking for. Now, Jesus applies the parable. In verses 6 and 7 we read, Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? So notice, Jesus begins by saying, hear what the unjust judge said. He is the focus. He is the aim. If you're going to understand the point of this parable, you have to hear him. You have to hear what he's saying. Jesus draws our attention right there. Why? Because you have to view God rightly. And if you're going to view God rightly, you have to learn the lesson of contrast that Jesus is teaching you. Before you apply this parable rightly, before you even see how this is connected to verse 1, how is this teaching me persistent prayer, and why is it connected to what the unjust judge said? Before you even get there, you have to be here. You have to see what the unjust judge said, so you can see what he's like. So you can learn by way of contrast, and see what God is not like, and hence, what God is like. The unjust judge delayed because he did not care. God, however, does care for his people. Even as Peter told the church to cast their anxieties upon him, open quote, because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 6, close quote. The unjust judge had no affections for and no relationship with the widow that kept coming to him. That is unlike God who loves his elect, whom he has loved before the foundation of the world, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Not according to them willing or according to them running, Romans chapter 9, but according to his own grace which he purposed in Christ Jesus before time began, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He loves his own with an everlasting love. He is the complete opposite of this unmoved, unaffectionate, unjust judge. Hear what the unjust judge says and see that Yahweh is nothing like him. Yahweh cares for his people. Yahweh is relationally connected to his people. The unjust judge eventually gave the widow justice, reluctantly. And if that wicked man would do that, to quote Jesus, shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him? It's a how much more argument. If this unjust, uncaring, unaffectionate, selfish Judge, would do this for this widow, how much more will Yahweh grant vindication and justice and retribution on behalf of his own elect? The answer is yes, he will avenge his own. That word that's used here for avenge is spot on. It's translated very well to be translated avenged. The word is used nine times in the New Testament and the majority of the times it's used in relationship to God's retribution. You can look how it's used here in verses 7 and 8. Look how it's used in uh, Luke 21, verse 22, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, Romans 12, 19, and Hebrews 10, 30. There ought to be, if you will, a warning tag on Christians. Because when people persecute, beat up, bloody, kill... The people of God, 
God takes that very seriously. And it's something that God will in due time fully avenge. He has pledged himself to be the avenger of blood on behalf of his people. To illustrate this, consider what Paul wrote to the church of the Thessalonians in the opening verses of 2 Thessalonians. He told them, in verse 4, that he boasted about them to the churches of God for their faith and for their patience in all of the persecutions and tribulations that they experienced. Then, in verse 6, beginning at verse 6, he went on to tell them this. It is a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is not something that God would just rather not talk about. Now, I don't want to talk about that whole avenging sort of thing. It's something he talks about quite a bit. It's part of his character to avenge and to vindicate. He considers it, as we saw in that verse that I just read, 2 Thessalonians 1.6, he considers it a just and a righteous thing. And although he tied, if you notice, both repayment and rest to the return of Jesus... The church of the Lord Jesus Christ is to nonetheless wait for it. And in the meantime, they, we, are not to take matters into our own hands. As it is written, Romans chapter 12, verse 19, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Which is why Paul would say right before that, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. So although, to use language from the text, although he bears long with them, and he bears long with the cries of his own elect, make no mistake, from God's vantage point, his people are not to take vengeance into their own hands, because retribution and vindication is coming, and from God's vantage point, it's coming quickly. In verse 8 we read, Jesus said, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? So notice the beginning of the verse. Jesus assured his disciples that justice, vengeance, and retribution will come, notice the language, speedily. Speedily. Now granted, the Bible's time frame, God's time frame, may not be our time frame, but the Bible's not shy about that. The Bible's not shy that his time frame and our time frame can sometimes be looked at differently. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and 9 says, But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. But the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us. Quick, important theological note there. This isn't a verse that you should use to say, God wants every person on the earth to come to know Him, and that's what He's waiting for. He's waiting for every person on the earth to come to know Him. It's not what this verse teaches. God is patient with us. Who's the us? You look back in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and verse 10. It's those who've obtained like precious faith. It's the elect. He's waiting for all of His elect to be gathered in. He's gathering all of His sheep into his fold. He's not slack concerning his promises as some concern as some count slackness, but he's long suffering towards us, not willing that any, his sheep, his elect, should perish, but that all, his sheep, his elect, should come to repentance. Christ's return may seem afar off, but from God's vantage point it's not. From God's vantage point, it's coming quickly. And if God's vantage point is that and if our vantage point seems like it's coming slowly, God's vantage point wins. It's coming quickly. And trust me, when it does come, and you look back from the eternal state, eventually, back at this time period, you'll say, wow, that was quick. That flew. Eternity and time, it's a big difference. Time is like a drop in the bucket, if you will. But I want you to notice what Jesus said. Here's the question that Jesus wants his hearers to think about. 
He said, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? It's as though Jesus was saying, Make no mistake, God will be found faithful. God will avenge His elect who cry out to Him day and night. Every bit of blood that has been shed will be accounted for. Either those who have martyred and shed the blood of saints, they will be forgiven because their sins have been appropriated to the cross of Jesus Christ, or they will give an account before the great white throne of God and be sentenced to the lake of fire. God will be faithful. Make no mistake. But here's the question Jesus is driving at. Don't wonder whether or not God will be faithful. He will. The question is, will you be faithful? When the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? Jesus turns it around. He assumes that you should assume by now that God is not like the unjust judge. He will do what's right in His time, in His way, with proper recourse, full vindication. He will do it. But the question is, will you be faithful? He'll demonstrate the veracity of His promises. He'll come through. But will He find faith when he returns. Well, what do you mean? This is a second coming context. So what kind of faith is he talking about here? He's talking about this kind of faith. Will you still find people, despite the persecution, despite the pain, despite the bloodshed, still praying, your kingdom come, your will be done? Even when they've been praying that prayer for 50 years, Will you still have saints who are in prayer saying, Even so, come, Lord Jesus. I'm expecting your return. Even though they've been expecting it for 80 years. Will he find faith? Or will they faint? Will they peter out? Or will they keep praying? Keep persevering? Will they take matters into their own hands? Or will they have faith and saying, No, I'm going to give place to wrath. Vengeance is the Lord's. He will repay. I believe he will repay. Will he find faith? Or will those who professed faith faint and show that they lacked the kind of faith that he was looking for? See, to show that kind of faith in this second coming context, it's to keep expecting the Lord's return, keep trusting him for vindication, keep praying that his kingdom would come, and keep expecting that in due time the Son of Man will come to verify and bring about all the promises that he had made about his second coming. So, the answer to the question, if you're wondering, by the way, will the Son of Man find faith when He returns? You look at the book of Revelation, the answer is yes, He will. It won't be the general characterization of the earth. We saw that in Luke chapter 17, verses 26 through 30, and verses 33 through 37. It's not going to be the general description. The last days will be like the days of Noah, and will be like the days of Lot. And the elect will be like Noah and will be like Lot. They'll be the few among the many. But nonetheless, when he comes, he will find faith. And Jesus knew that because the reason why he would find faith on the earth is because ultimately he would be the one who's preserving the faith of those whom he's called to himself. Now let's connect this to the very beginning. How is this a parable then that men ought always to pray and not lose heart? We must see the connection between Luke's preface and Jesus' emphasis if we're going to understand this right. Jesus emphasized hearing what the unjust judge said. So tie that in with Luke's preface. Luke said Jesus spoke a parable to them that men ought always to pray and not to faint. That was Luke's preface. Jesus' emphasis was hear what the unjust judge said. The implication being this. If you understand that God is not like the unjust judge... That he is a loving father and a righteous judge who will vindicate his elect. You will keep crying out to him. You will keep praying. You will know that your cries have not fallen upon deaf ears, but the ears of a God who has loved his people with an everlasting love before the foundation of the world. So much so that he paid the ultimate price for them by sending his son to the cross. That's the connection. Jesus is assuming that if you see what Yahweh is like, if you really get it, you will persevere in prayer. If you think he's like the unjust judge and you think you're praying and he don't care and you think that it doesn't matter because he is indifferent and apathetic to your plight or your pain or your bloodshed, if you think that, you're going to give up. 
you're going to faint. But if you have a right view of God, you'll have a right view of the delays that you experience. And you'll understand that though justice is delayed, it does not mean justice denied. That is the important application of this parable. A little bit more, just to unpack that. That, in a sense, I think, does unpack the parable. But now, by way of application, I want to ask the question, why is this important? And I want to give three reasons. One, I want to say, is found within this very chapter. The second is also found within the Gospel of Luke, but it's not found in this chapter. And then, for a third reason, I want us to look at two examples from the Old Testament. So why is this so important that God's people pray and not lose heart? Number one is simple. It's found right here. It's an outworking of the kind of faith that Jesus is looking for when he returns. You see that in verse 8. That's why it's so important. It's an outworking of true saving faith. What is? Persevering prayer. Persevering prayer, trusting the character and the sovereignty of God, is a true outworking of saving faith. And it's the kind of faith that Jesus is looking for. That's point number one. Point number two, because Jesus called his disciples to such end time persevering prayer. That's why it's so important. It's not only an outworking, it's something he called his people to. In Luke chapter 21, verse 36, he told his disciples, but stay awake at all times that you may have the strength to escape all these things that are going to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. So one, it's an outworking of saving faith. Number two, he commands it. Number three, persevering prayer is not only an outworking of saving faith. Persevering prayer is a means through which God preserves his people. Persevering prayer is a means through which God preserves his people. I want to illustrate that to you from two places in the Old Testament. From a psalm and from a prophetic book. How long, O Lord, prayers? The kind of prayers that Jesus is referring to here when people are saying, How long? Are you going to avenge me? Are you going to give me justice? How long prayers? Pretty common throughout the Bible. You see them in heaven with the saints who are martyred. You see them in the Old Testament coming from the lips of men like David and Habakkuk whose prayers we'll look at briefly. In Psalm chapter 13, it's six verses long. And David began that psalm by asking, How long, O Lord? In one shape or another, four times in the opening two verses. How long, how long, how long, how long? Then when you get to verse 3, he petitions God. Somewhere in verse 3 and then in verse 4, he gives reasons for the petitions that he's asking. But then something changes. In the middle of this psalm of lament, the psalm of lament becomes a psalm of praise. The how long, how long, how long, how long from verses 1 and 2 gives way to this in verses 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. Persevering prayer is a means by which God preserves His people. David shows up into the presence of God lamenting how long he comes out of that time of prayer praising God and saying, You've dealt bountifully with me. That's what prayer can do. You're in the presence of God. Presumably, you have the Word of God somewhere near you. So you got the voice of God coming to you from the text of Scripture, the Spirit of God ministering to you, and you leave oftentimes noticeably different than how you went in. Kind of like David did in Psalm 13. Habakkuk is another example. Now there, you could look at the entire book. Because the book, Habakkuk, three chapters long, it opens up with the prophet asking a how long question. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2, along, if you keep reading, with other questions about God's justice. You see that in verses 2 through 4. Then he gets a response from God. Chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. And then he praises. If only slightly, he praises. Verses 12 and 13, the first half of 13. So even there, the how long happens, chapter 1, verse 2, then he praises, even if slightly, in chapter 1, verses 12 and beginning of 13. But then 
came some more questions. He got kind of an answer, and the answer only opened up the door to more questions, so he asked them in verses 12 through 17. Then in chapter 2, verse 1, he set himself to hear God's answer. An answer God did. God answered him in chapter 2, verses 2 through 20. And then the conclusion of the matter is found in Habakkuk's prayer. His prayer of response found in chapter 3. The conclusion of which is this. Look at the bookends of Habakkuk's book. How long? Chapter 1, verse 2. And now here, listen to what you see in chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. He writes, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, Though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet and He will make me walk on my high hills. Both men had how long questions for vindication and for justice. And at the time in which their lament turned to praises, they had not seen the justice that they were hoping for. But prayer was a means by which God preserved His people, and they came out of their lament praising instead. What an awesome picture. An awesome picture. Therefore, I conclude this morning with this exhortation. Hear what the unjust judge said. And know that your God is nothing like Him. He is righteous, He is compassionate, and He is caring. And may such a view of God spur you to keep praying, and may such a view of God spur you to a right view of waiting, so that you may be found faithful when the Son of Man comes, or if you go to see Him first. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank You for the Word of Your Son. Thank you for such a rich instruction. Thank you for such encouragement for your people that they can cleave to, that we could cleave to, even in the midst of the most tumultuous persecutions and pains and delays. We proclaim in agreement with your word that you are faithful. And we know that the real question is not whether or not you will be faithful. You are faithful and true. It is intrinsically a part of who you are. And we proclaim that and we praise you for that. We pray, Heavenly Father, and along the lines of Jesus' question at the end of this teaching, we pray, Father, that you would preserve us to be found faithful. Therefore, Father, I pray that you would preserve in our minds a right view of you. And may painful providences not cloud that view of you. May the view of who you are and your character and your ways and your attributes shine through the clouds and the pain and the rain of this life very clearly. Father, I pray that you would find us faithful to keep praying your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Find us by your grace faithful to keep looking to the sky for the blessed hope and the returning of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Cause us to keep saying, despite the waiting, even so come, Lord Jesus. And may you find us continually praying that, either till your Son returns, or till we go home to see Him first. May it be. We ask these things, Father, in the matchless name of the spotless Lamb, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen.